I will now call back to order the regular meeting of the Lake Forest School District 67 Board of Education for November 15th, 2016. May I have a roll call, uh, please, Eileen. Dr. Lemke? Here. Mr. Borkowski? Here. Mr. Novit? Here. Mrs. Clemenson? Here. Mr. Ford? Here. Mrs. Sands? Here. Mr. Folker? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. I often try to use the President's report to focus us, the board, the administration, the staff, our parents and community, on our vision, mission, and milestones. We are currently in the midst of some exciting work, which will hopefully accelerate our progress towards that vision in a significant way. And we'll be voting on a chunk of that later tonight. But I'll save that news until next month, as we are still working through many details. Today, I want to share an example of what learning looks like in our new vision. Two weeks ago, our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade orchestra students had a unique and memorable experience. They spent two days rehearsing with Mark Wood, culminating with an incredible concert. Mark Wood is the founder of the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, is an Emmy Award-winning creative genius, an international recording artist, and he also created a music education program named Electrify Your Strings, which is the program that our students experienced with him. Mark's program embodies our district's vision perfectly. The tagline of his program is igniting potential, inspiring passion, which sounds a lot like our vision statement. I heard some of Mark's discussion with the students. None of it was about notes on the page, but rather was about empowering students to think and act creatively while building self-confidence. I looked at our students' experience through the lens of our district's vision statement, and I saw a lot of overlap. As you can see on the video that's starting to play, the program was entirely hands-on with the crazy high level of engagement. It was experiential versus just another day in the classroom, and it literally extended the learning beyond the traditional classroom walls as the students spent two full days on the main stage at the high school. It involved world-class talent, with the talent not only teaching our students, but literally participating alongside our students. We talked about owning a dinner conversation, and this certainly happened here. And our assessment milestone was achieved as the students truly took the ultimate multi-dimensional assessment in front of 500 people, although Mark Wood re prefers the term rock concert over multi-dimensional assessment. Three, four, five, 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 five. Another milestone in our vision is partnership, and this program had everything to do with partnerships. Our DPM Fine Arts Department, led by Tom Cardamone, Sarah Truden, Truding, and Diane Renner, partnered with our friends at the Spirit of 67 and Applause, which is the high school's booster club for fine arts. Due to the financial support of the Spirit and Applause, this program became a reality. Special thanks to both the DPM fine arts staff, Tom, Sarah, and Diane, as well as the Spirit of 67, led by Molly Sarver. I spoke with many students during and after the program, and one comment really stood out to me. One student who was ecstatic about the experience simply said, I am so sad it is over. For those two days, the entire group of students couldn't wait to get to school. For those two days, our district's vision became a reality for those students. Was this program a once in a lifetime mountaintop experience? Maybe, but I really hope not. I hope that we as the adult leaders charged with achieving that vision can use it to better understand what the future of education at District 67 might look like. A tangible measure of success for us might be that instead of hearing, I'm so sad that it's over, we hear students saying, that was awesome, and I can't wait to come to school tomorrow for my next adventure. That is what our vision looks like. To add a bit more color to this, we have a video of one section of the students' final assessment, the DPM orchestra playing Eleanor Rigby alongside rock star Mark Wood. While you're watching that, think about what you might want to ask Mark if you could talk to him, as he'll be joining us via video link for some Q&A immediately following the video.
So it really was fantastic. Um, Mark is on a video conference call with us. Hello, Mark. Um, so for all the board members, we're going to have a chance to talk with Mark. You're going to have to use two microphones when you talk. Our TV man, Mr. Johnson, wants us to use this microphone. And in order for Mark to hear us, you need to use this microphone. So we're just going to pass this around. So um, Mark, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Not only did you inspire our students in such a magical way, but I think you also maybe inspired us adults uh, showing us really what our vision looks like. Uh, and it's something that we're striving for. I thought maybe you could share with us a little bit about your experience teaching students in this manner, what your goals are, and a little bit maybe how you define success as you do this program. Absolutely. First of all, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, because the audio is breaking up a little bit. Just let me know if it's clear and uh, not breaking up on your end. Um, and, and Mike, yeah, just let me know if I need to repeat anything. Um, but thank you guys. You, I'm good? Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you guys so much. It is very impressive to me that uh, Mike recognized what it was that we were doing that night. And I think it's really important that people like Mike, leaders in education, view the creative arts as an important vehicle similar to the kind of impact that sports have the academic world for us and the people in this room you firmly believe like i do is that it's a combination of the academic or athletics and the art the arts are so important and you guys already know that for the past uh, 15 years, I've been going to schools. We do hundreds of thousands of students and teachers. And as Mike observed, the empowerment of these kids of emotions, their imagination, is so important to their lives that I feel that it's really a great opportunity for us to really engage um, the community. Uh, volume down on my laptop. Does that affect my voice at all? You're good. Good? Um, so, yeah, I, a lot of it, I mean, I'm in Lubbock, Texas right now. We're working to, with 1,200 string players, and my band is flying in. Members of the trans and Orchestra work with these kids. And a lot of it's really about the simple mentoring. I think it's really important that we work with a collaborative effort of the traditional music um, educational program. But my friends, as you know, we're living in a different world than when we were going to school. Uh, these kids are different. Technology is different. Society is different. We must engage these kids at a much higher level of creativity at a much higher level, most importantly about engaging them with the people surrounding them. In music, as you guys know, music is the ultimate in um, communication to another person. It's very personal, it's very special, it's magical, and equally important, it's a critical stepping stone to being successful in life is your ability to express yourself not only verbally but through art. When you express yourself on creativity, you are exploring yourself and learning about yourself. And, and a lot of the lessons that we are teaching these kids is not only about notes, but how do they apply their musical talents to the world around them with compassion, understanding. Um, welcoming differences in people, welcoming diversity. And string programs are still are struggling a little bit. Mark, we may have lost you. Antiquated or the presentation become antiquated. We must be leaders in the progress of keeping up to space with the way these kids think. I mean, they're living with this thing all the time. 
as you know, and how do we engage them so that this is actually removed and put in their case and they're only dealing with the music and the expression. So we're finding tremendous success because of leaders like the people in this room is that you're recognizing the important opportunity. The question of the century is what can we do now to prepare these kids for the 21st century experience? And I, my friends, I can't tell you something you already know. It's about being creative, imaginative, and it's truly an American virtue that we are able to explore uh, our expression. And I think, of, I, you know, you can express yourself in sports, you can express yourself in math and science, but math and science are very specific data-based information. You can't cry in science, you can't cry in football, but you can cry when you make music. And when you access your deep emotions, um, man, these kids change, and then they become much more sensitive to the energies around them. So, I mean, I could go on for hours uh, sharing this with you. Uh, but so, I'm I'm ready for any other questions if you want, or you want me to keep going. Uh, I just wanted to um, make a a quick comment. I. I talk about tears. I was almost welling up watching the video because three years ago we put together a mission and vision and uh, we talked about educating without boundaries and what an amazing example of that this is and um, I know my Facebook feed was blowing up as parents were posting um, their experiences, they were overwhelmed, they were so excited. So um, I just want to thank you for, for working with our kids. I know they had an amazing um, experience with you. It's great for me to be able to see the full you know, video because I only saw little snippets on Facebook. Um, so thank you. And uh, thank you to our teachers for really living the vision because um, it's just a perfect example of what we've been trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff has a question for you. Uh, Mark, first of all, thank you so much. I, I wanted to let you know I saw you about five Christmases ago at the Allstate Arena, and you guys were wonderful. So, um, And relative to crying in uh, math, you've never seen my son come home from a math quiz. But <laughs> that being said, um, obviously engagement is... It, <laughs> Engagement is a key element of what you do, and it's quite clear from watching the video that um, the kids are deeply engaged. Uh, I guess my question is, do you find uh, that that translates effectively over into technical advancement, or uh, that, that not, to, not only are they having fun, but they're able then to learn more relative to how to play the instrument, how to express themselves on the instrument, and so forth? Yes, and, and again, if, if the audio is breaking up, I, it was breaking a little bit for your question, but thank you for that question. I think that without question, life lessons, as you know, in a school, no offense to you guys, but it is a bubble. It's a closed environment that's protective. And the sooner teenagers understand the way the world works, and the world, the way it works, to have to present ourselves. And I use the word magnet every day. We must get these kids to understand about the power of a magnet holding people and energy towards them so that they benefit from the success of having that kind of bonding. And in music, there's no rules. I mean, there's some uh, parameters, but it's so uh, emotion driven. And, and by the way, I have to tell you this, that your question to me is, what have I seen great disappointment in our school system is um, the struggle that the teacher had in activating 21st century technology thinking expression. Remember, in the string world, orchestra world, it's very much based on classical music from Europe. I'm, and I love classical 
music and I play it all the time. It's not about music is better than that music. What it is about is finding the student in the music, finding that person, finding their voice. And once they find themselves in expressing themselves and learning about themselves, then the benefits of that are, tra are, are transformative. My, my friends, there's one word that we find to be a critical word with uh, students. It's called confidence. And if you do confidence, whether you're graduating from Harvard University or you dropped out from high school, if you exude confidence, and sure, you will be successful. And I find that when a kid finds confidence in the abstract concept of music and um, uh, to allow us to learn about ourselves, our mistakes, our virtues, our successes, and our failure are a beautiful contribution to the way we uh, form ourselves. So when I work with kids, even though shy kids, I say, it doesn't matter if you're shy as a person. You play music, you must be strong, confident, and fearless, because you will never get hurt and you will never fall, and I will protect you, and everything's gonna be great in the world, but you must jump out of the airplane without a parachute, because that's the only way you're gonna learn. Get out of your comfort zone and change the way you think about yourself every day, and then you'll have, you'll have a fighting chance as you go out the real world. Mark, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, uh, again, for inspiring our students and, and being with us tonight. This has been fantastic, so thank you. I'm sorry, Mike. Sorry. Moving on, if that wasn't enough awesomeness, I actually do have one more item. Uh, Ann Whipple has quietly started a new reward and recognition program. I think that, uh, as I understand, all the staff will be seeing and hearing more about it over the coming weeks. Reward and recognition really plays a large part in defining an organization's culture. Do we, success, do we celebrate success in parallel with working hard, or is it just drudgery every day? I I believe Ann's program includes both bigger celebrations as well as lots and lots of smaller ways to recognize great work. Sort of random act of, acts of kindness is a mentality. One element is the use of something that she has discovered called the talking pen. These are small gifts and the idea is that they would be given out early, often, and without lots of thought or analysis. I'd encourage every staff member and every board member to have a small stash of the talking pens. And when you see good work, you should give the person a talking pen as a small way of saying, thanks, you're doing a great job. You can give it to them right then and there. You don't need a committee meeting to debate if it's worthy. The talking pens are silly, yes, but they serve as a simple, fun, and real way of reminding our people that they're appreciated. So I'm pleased to set the example of that right now. The report I just gave was relatively easy for me. I had a pretty clear idea of what I wanted to show, and I, and I was fortunate to have a fantastic support staff to make it happen. So I'd like the first two talking pens to go to Cornelius and Judy, who worked with a variety of people to ensure that the technology worked tonight. And Jack Bailey in the corner. Uh, Jack's actually the high school student who got very little notice from Steve Douglas, who got very little notice from me, that I'd like a video tonight. Uh, so Jack, come on up as well. Thank you for your hard work. And Ann told me if you push this. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you very, very much. And everyone should get more of these from Ann. And the idea is not that I'm the only one giving these out. Everyone should be giving them out, not just board members, staff, administration, principals. When you see somebody doing something good, 
give him a talking pen. And that, believe it or not, concludes the president's report. We move on to the superintendent's report. Man, I don't know how I'd try to keep up with that. <laughs> right. Right. Well, I, I, will, I will talk about something that is a variety of things that I think are very important. I'll start with today being school board members day in <laughs> Illinois. And at your places, yeah, you, you, get a, you get a candy bar, right? So they take a moment to thank our board members for their commitment and dedication to our students, to our, our staff, and to our community. Uh, Sarah, Dale, thank you very, very much. And Diane, thank, thank you. you very much. And congratulations. It was an amazing experience. Our board members give up their personal and family time and to share their talents uh, to ensure our students are provided an exemplary education when they not only prepare as their students for college or career, but also to be leaders in the 21st century. Thanks to each and every one of you. And I think often of my former board president, and we have Ben is a student here, so I'll talk to Ben. Ben is videotaping what Jeff, Jack, like I said, Jack, I'll call you all kinds of things if you stick around long enough, Jack. Um, uh, my former board president used to say that the school board is the purest form of democracy. And what he meant by that is that uh, communities care more about their schools than any other organization typically in their town. They generate a lot of revenue and they give it to seven trustees of the community to spend in the way that those trustees uh, find uh, the, the most wise and prudent way possible on the resource that they care about most in their lives, which is their children. So they have the two things that people care the most about, their money and their kids, and that's what the school board does for uh, no money and often very little thanks. And so today is an opportunity to say thank you. Uh, we really really appreciate all the work that our school board members do and it's really great working with all of you. Thank you. But that does not conclude the superintendent's report. <laughs> there is more and exciting stuff to come like PSAT testing. So a letter went out uh, a couple days ago on the upcoming PSAT testing for grades eight and nine. There is a context to this. It does wind up being important. Uh, the schools across the state of Illinois are challenged with uh, uh, undertaking that, uh, frankly, none of us had really expected. The state switched from testing all students using the ACT as a college administration or a college acceptance test to the SAT. The ACT had a suite of assessments known as the Plan and the Explore and then the ACT itself and one built on the next and you could see that students were growing or not growing as the case might be uh, but very often very very often growing and you could look and see the the value that uh, the schools were adding to, to their learning likewise uh, uh, the SAT has a suite of assessments and that is known as the PSAT 89 and then there is the uh, better known PSAT, which is used for the National Merit Scholarship, which students take as either sophomores or juniors, and then the culminating assessment is the SAT, which will be the new college acceptance test for the state of Illinois. So our students on either December 3rd or December 10th, uh, both on Saturday between 8.45 and 12 uh, p.m., will be taking the PSAT 8, that's our eighth grade students, and this is a, an assessment that will be both important to students and to their teachers and uh, the, the, the high school in, in setting a baseline for them on where they will grow from there. Uh, but there will be a suite of assessments. This assessment being done on Saturday is a very unusual thing in my experience, but it is a commonplace thing all across the North Shore. Uh, something that, frankly, I didn't think would be possible to assess uh, all of our eighth graders on a weekend, but it, in fact, is the norm all up and down uh, the Chicago area. Uh, I want to go on with a couple other comments about things that I've been learning while um, Ms. Renner and 
Miss Truding, we're doing awesome things with our kids. I was learning some other awesome stuff and I missed the concert, which I really don't like to do. So just like Mrs. Renner and Truding were demonstrating learning, I was with a group of superintendents learning things that uh, I had never experienced before. I wanted to show you one of those. I'll be fine. So this is. Do it. Well. Here goes something, I guess. So the conference I was at was a bunch of superintendents and they were uh, learning to do things with technology that they had not done before, learning ways to communicate that they had not attempted before. And we had an incredibly engaging speaker, one that reminds me a lot of Mark Wood, that he's like, look, you gotta be better than everything else around you if you want people to pay attention. This is one of the videos he used as an example. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump. You got it. Whoa, my ski's slipping off. Just remember, never snow plow, okay? No snow plows. Keep it straight, and you'll be fine. Keep okay. Now, at some point, somebody's gonna, uh, you'll hear somebody say, look, the longer you wait, the worse it gets. Straight. Do you go faster on the in run? A little bit. A little bit? Yeah. Is it any steeper, do you think? Not same, much? Same steepness, it's just longer. Well, just longer. Just longer. Just a bigger 20, that's all. Yep. It's a bigger 20. Go ahead. You got this. I got it. It's fine. You'll, you'll be fine. Okay. Here. The longer you wait, you'll be more scared. I go. So getting started is half the challenge. Now I have to get back to that. Where was that? How do I get to that, Cornelius? Oh no, I did it again. All right, how do I stop that? All right, there we go. So I shut that down. All right, okay, here we go. Okay, so I'll show you another thing that, uh, that we learned I hadn't seen before. Let me start this over. So this is a program. Take a picture of a math problem. It shows you the result. You ask it, now I want to see step-by-step -step instructions. And it shows you all of that too. And this is one of the things, uh, sort of the, one of the blow your mind things that uh, the world is changing around us. And uh, this is a free app. I showed this to a bunch of high school kids the other day and they said, yeah, I've got that already. Uh, so, the, the thing that uh, the speaker was trying to get us to do was to, uh, was to go on Twitter and to use Twitter as a communication tool. So you can follow me now if you want to at MSimic on Twitter. So I'm taking videos, I posted one 
Uh, did one just the other day, amazing program over at Everett where the kids invited their, uh, their relatives that were veterans. Uh, they flew in from all over the country and then they escorted their veteran relative down through the, the center of, the, uh, of all the kids who were cheering and got to introduce them to the entire, uh, to the entire school community at Everett. It was a, a, an amazing event and really, really moving. So uh, MCIMIC at Twitter, you can see all, sort of, all sorts of cool stuff about uh, 67 and 115. Can you, Ann, give Mike a talking pen? We'll get him on Twitter <laughs> whenever you see him next. That's fantastic. Uh, all right. So my final point is uh, what, what, what's, uh, uh, this is a, known as Bloom's Taxonomy. A guy named Benjamin Bloom, he developed uh, Bloom's Taxonomy uh, it's either in the 50s or the 60s, and it stopped in the old days right here at Evaluate. And then in the last decade and a half, they added another one, which is to create. So if you think back on your schooling, the overwhelming majority of what you did in school was to hear facts, write facts down, and then when you were uh, assessed on that, you wrote the facts down that you had written down and showed that you can remember those facts. This is an exercise in short-term memory. So what was really being assessed was whether or not you had a sound short-term memory. And then what Bloom was advocating for as University of Chicago researcher is, look, we should be getting kids to understand, explain concepts and ideas, apply them in new situations, analyze and draw conclusions from among a variety of different connections and ideas Take a stand, justify your position or your decision, and then the highest of all of them is to create something that nobody has seen before. Create something on your own. And that is where this comes in. So this is known as a Google Lit Trip. And I chose I chose a high school one because it, it's the best example. But uh, their Google Lit trips are for uh, what's the duckling book about Boston? Here come the ducklings. Make way, for ducklings. make way for ducklings. There's a Google Lit trip on make way for ducklings. So you can take kids there. They use Google Earth to do this kind of stuff. And this is the best example that I found that was short and applicable. So using Google Earth, and what's important is this isn't something that an adult created for kids to consume. This is something that kids created. Welcome to this Google Lit Trip for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, created by Gregory Greenleaf and the students of his 2012-2013 Advanced Placement English course at Greeley High School in Cumberland, Maine. So Google Lit Lakes lets you take a trip through various places. You can have little call-out boxes. According to Mr. Greenleaf, Frankenstein is a great novel, but it is a difficult novel in many ways. And you can the first challenge it. is helping students unlearn what they know about the story. I do this by simply asking my students to identify the Frankenstein in Frankenstein. Most students will answer that the name refers to the monster, the tall guy with green paint and bolts on the side of his head. Actually, the name refers to Victor Frankenstein, the creator of the monster, or creature as he is often called. I then ask students to tell me what they know of the search for the Northwest Passage. Again. This is a topic that few students know about. Neither did I, in fact, when I first read the novel. After a... So 
this is a culminating, culminating event. And when we talk about project-based learning, or if we talk about uh, assessing students in ways that are not pen and paper, this is the kind of stuff that kids can do. Younger kids can do this. They can create something new from what they have learned. And what that requires them to do, if it's, if it's well done, it will require them uh, to let me pull up the presentation again. It requires in, embedded in that task is remembering what's going on, understanding it, applying it, analyzing and evaluating, making decisions, and then finally creating something new. So you can create an assessment that all of these things are implicit in that so that the assessment isn't just about what did I tell you and can you remember it. And that's what project-based learning is all about. That's what inquiry does. So kids inquire, they explore, and then you want them to demonstrate their learning in a way that is different than the way that was presented to them. So that is the superintendent's report. Thank you. So Mike, I understand everything you just said, and it, it fits in very nicely with the Mark Wood example. It's all sort of what our vision can look like. And it's easy for me to understand the environment stuff, the projects, the, the we're gonna spend money on changing the classroom. And you gave the example of inquiry, which we have a fair bit of at the lower grades. Can you talk for a minute about how we achieve the vision on the assessment side and that kind of thing? How, how do we take those things you just saw and integrate them K-8 or K-12? So a really great example of that on curriculum night in uh, the middle school. And the, the science teachers got together and is one of their inquiry units for this year. And I spoke with uh, three of the science teachers working on that. They are incredibly energized. And what, uh, what they had created was that uh, they were going to try to examine, they were going to examine a problem uh, related to the cities and uh, explore the problem and then bring in their parents to present as judges for whether or not they had addressed this problem in a way that was meaningful. And it's an entirely different way of teaching for our teachers. It's completely out of their comfort zone, and, which is a good thing for them, and hats off uh, to them for doing that. But that's the, that's the kind of learning that, uh, that the kids can do, and, and what, what is uh, uh, really important is that the teacher winds up learning way more than they ever expected to along the way too. So uh, the culminating project is the presentation and the vetting of the quality of the ideas. Thank you. Other questions or comments for our superintendent? Seeing none, thank you, Mike. We move to public participation. public participation. Are there any members of the public who would like to address the board? Seeing none, we move to reports. We have one report tonight, uh, strategic plan update number one, Mike Simic. This one will be shorter and with a lot of razzle dazzle here. Are you ready? That's it. That's the one slide. So what I want to do is talk about what the strategic plan entails. There are three uh, very substantial ideas that we're working on as a district right now. There are obviously more than three, but uh, for the sake of, uh, of, of clarity and time, I wanted to talk about just three. Uh, the first of those is inquiry, expanding inquiry through all grades. Just talked about that briefly just a couple moments ago that units of inquiry are created. We have six, the goal is to have 14 units of inquiry for science. We have six created at this point in time, and we're expanding that. And uh, for somebody that doesn't know what uh, a unit of inquiry might be about, best way to think of it is when the, when the teacher shifts out of the mode of providing information 
and shifts into the role of a facilitator of student learning. And the, the inquiry comes from the students. The students' curiosity then drives the instruction. The teacher serves as a facilitator in that. Uh, probably the best example of that might be uh, seen in, in coaching. Another example will, is often seen in the arts. It's often overlooked in the arts, but we had an awesome example of it today with Mark Wood. Uh, the, I think the most challenging thing that we're going to be doing this year is trying to create a definition of what social and emotional growth looks like in our districts. One of our milestones, it is easily, our administrators agree on this, uh, about 90% of them say, hands down, this is the single toughest thing in the milestone. What is social and emotional well-being? much less what is social and emotional growth. And that is the challenge that we've been given by the Board of Education. So uh, Ingrid Weimer and Emily Correa are hard at work with a group of teachers trying to uh, figure this out. And uh, you'll be hearing more and more about this as the year goes on. Uh, this is something that is a cornerstone of both the elementary district and the high school, something we heard over and over and over again. A uh, high achieving district and our parents reminded us uh, constantly in every single conversation, yep, academics is important, but happy and healthy and productive are, uh, are more important to us. And so make sure you do both. Don't do one at the expense of the other. So that is the tallest, uh, tallest mountain for us to climb. The third thing that every parent will have heard about from their student is Reader's Workshop. We sent 70 we had 73 teachers in this room earlier this year. We flew in a bunch of people from the Columbia Teachers College in Manhattan, and they worked with our staff for four entire days. And we also flew groups of students or of, of staff, uh, including administrators, out to Columbia University to learn from uh, the, the best in the business at what, uh, how to do readers' workshop. And a readers' workshop the workshop model, uh, the high school has done a, a workshop model for many years, and this is something new for the elementary. And what it is, is uh, small group instruction. Uh, you think about when we went to school, it was all large group instruction. Sometimes you had independent reading, but a lot of the instruction was one teacher and 25 students, everybody listening at the same time to one person doing the work, a workshop model is small group, a uh, little lecture burst it's called, inspire the kids, they go off, they do their own thing, and then the teacher works with them in little pods or individually. So you have a group of three or four, kids often work uh, with each other. And so uh, the, the, the analogy that I use for a reader's workshop and why the workshop model is effective, uh, sports is a good analogy for this, and in the world of basketball, it's all about how many times you touch the ball. If you don't touch the ball, you don't grow. You have to have a lot of touches in order to grow and develop as a player. And the old way that we taught was there was one ball and there were 25 kids and it was sort of a ping pong match between the 25 kids and the one adult. And with a workshop model, you have 25 balls. And that is a critical difference there. And so each kid is it's an individualized instruction. It's personalized, much more personalized, and much more challenging for each individual student to grow. So the workshop model is in place. I give our teachers an enormous amount of credit. Uh, they have rolled up their sleeves. They've embraced it. All of our kids already are getting the workshop model K-8. Uh, just like last year, they got the workshop model and, uh, in writing across the district. So we are well underway in establishing that, and those are three of the most important things that we're going to do this year. Thank you. Any questions? We also discussed this in an earlier workshop, uh, so uh, if, uh, uh, if there aren't any questions, I understand that because we had ample opportunity to talk earlier. So. I have one quick question. Yep. Um, when will we see this year's strategic plan up on our website? Tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. 
We now move to board committees. Uh, board of Education chaired by Beth. The Education Committee has not met since our last board meeting. Our next meeting will be on Wednesday, December 7th at 8.15 here at West Campus. Thanks, Beth. We move to Board Finance and Operations Committee, chaired by Rob Lemke. Thanks, Mike. Um, the Finance and Operations Committee did meet in, on November 8th, um, basically to discuss some financing options for the grand plan that we'll talk about later today. Uh, all the board members were in attendance except the president and the vice president. So um, I think uh, we all know what's going on. I mean, you two might not. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, no surprise, Jennifer and her, uh, Brittany and the administration um, did a great job of talking to us about some funding opportunities and um, uh, uh, really relied on our five-year projections um, and the software we have for that. So I think the board members feel pretty confident in what we're gonna vote on later today, but if there are comments or questions, Jen's here to answer them. I just have a quick comment, which is um, I learned a tremendous amount at that meeting. Um, and I think based on what we're going to be talking about soon, that a lot was learned by everyone in the room. And we have been able to make tremendous progress. The administration's been able to make tremendous progress as a result of, of the collaboration and the work that we're really doing in these meetings. So um, kudos to everyone for making that happen. Um, it was just a great experience. Don't say kudos too quickly, because uh, Mike might give Jenna talking. talking pen? I talking might give pen. you a talking pen. <laughs> I might actually give you. If I had any talking pens, I would start <laughs> passing them out. But I didn't know about the talking pens uh, yet. Uh, to finish, uh, just quickly, our next meeting is January 17th in this building at 8 a.m. Talk primarily about the audit. Thank you, Rob. Questions or comments? Move on to the policy committee, chaired by Jeff Volker. Thank you, Mike. The policy committee met this morning, Tuesday, November 15th at 8 a.m. here in the West, Cam West Campus building. Uh, in attendance were committee members Jeff Volker, Suzanne Sands, and Kent Novit, as well as Mike Simic, Ingrid Weimer, and Eileen Fowler. The purpose of the meeting was twofold. One, to discuss and review a proposed policy in support of the board's approval of full-day kindergarten tuition waivers for at-risk students and two, to review policies that are neither found in the District 67 nor the District 115 policy manual. With, regarding the full-day kindergarten tuition waiver for at-risk students, Dr. Weimer provided the committee with an overview of the process that is used to determine if a kindergarten student, either half-day or full-day, is considered at-risk. She also clarified that this potential policy is different from our current policy 4.140, which deals with waiver of student fees, in that this policy is dealing with an optional tuition payment versus a mandatory school fee therefore the need for a separate policy. The committee then reviewed a rough draft of the proposed policy and agreed that further clarification was needed around how uh, tuition, specifically prepaid tuition for current full day students, would be refunded uh, back to parents if their child was found to be at risk and how that process would be administered. The committee also requested that further drafts be vetted by the board's legal counsel before being presented for fu uh, future discussion and recommendation. As a result, Dr. Weimer will rewrite the proposed policy, run it by our legal folks, and present it at our next meeting, which we tentatively plan on having in January. One of the responsibilities of the policy committee on an ongoing basis is to periodically review the policy manual and determine if there are opportunities to add new policies, eliminate outdated policies, or better align policies with current practice. As a part of this effort, the committee took it upon themselves to review all policies that are currently listed as reserve reserved in the District 67 policy manual. In other words, we reviewed policies that have been recommended by press but have not ever been adopted by District 67. Back in September, you may remember that we looked at those policies that are currently in the District 115 policy manual but not in our policy manual. At this meeting, we reviewed those policies that are not in either district's policy manual to determine if any of them made sense to try to adopt. I won't go into what they were because there was a fairly long line, but the bottom line is that after discussion, the committee agreed not to bring any of those policies to the board for approval as they were either found to be redundant to the Illinois school code mandates, they were high school specific policies, or they were policies that required a level of additional oversight and administration that added little to no value versus what is already in place in the district. So we uh, did our job relative to reviewing what's out there that we don't currently have in our manual and determined that we don't need to bring them in at this time. So. The meeting adjourned at 8.45, uh, and as I said, we will tentatively plan on meeting again in January to review a large press release that came out just this last week. That's it. Look forward to that. 
Any questions? Moving on to the Compensation Committee. Tom. The Compensation Committee was scheduled to meet last night, and we had some conflicts, so we had to postpone the meet meeting. I'm uh, not quite sure when we're going to reschedule, but you'll hear about it. There'll be no talking pens for Rob or myself, as we completely blew off the meeting by mistake. We move to the Joint, joint Shared Services Committee, uh, which has not met. Board Operating Procedures Committee, Jeff. Thank you. The District 67 Board Operating Procedures Committee has met twice since our last board meeting. We met first on Wednesday, October 26th, and then again this morning, uh, November 15th. Uh, members Jeff Volker, Kent Novit, and Mike Simic were all present for both meetings. At the October 26th meeting, the committee completed Section 1 of the proposed Board Operating Procedures Manual and agreed to draft a charter that will be presented this evening and approved at tonight's, hopefully approved at tonight's meeting. This morning when we met, uh, we agreed upon the charter to be brought forward tonight and began working on Section 2 of the manual and discussing, frankly, uh, some, I think, good things relative to, as board members, how we should be working with each other discussing issues with each other both in and outside of board meetings. So it's, it's, uh, this exercise has proven to be um, a bit more tenuous, or not tenuous, but a bit more uh, tedious, there's the word, than I think we originally anticipated, but it's also been, I think, an excellent opportunity for us to dig into things that we may or may not take for granted at a level of detail that allows us to truly understand how we should be working together and with the community and with the administration. So I hope that means that the output at the end will be worth the effort, but um, it's been a good exercise. So our next meeting is currently scheduled for uh, November 29th at 6 p.m. Mr. Novit, do you have a question or a comment? And I'll actually touch the button after about the 20th meeting I've been here, but uh, Jeff has been doing a tremendous job carrying a tremendous load on the uh, uh, committee, and it's just appreciated we have shelved all discussion on board dress code, though, for the time being. I got dressed up tonight, so that's yeah, good. I, I would like to echo uh, Kent's, uh, Kent's remarks. I, I really, really have uh, high regard for the work that, that Jeff has done with this Board Operating Procedures Committee. It's, it's obviously something that you're really skilled at, uh, tremendous uh, attention to detail but also just uh, a level of persistence and tenacity working, uh, working through this, trying to get the board uh, a finished draft. It's really good work, it really is. A meaningful discussion and just very well, well, well led and well organized. Where's my talking pen? Yeah. <laughs> you never know. Moving to the liaison reports, NSSED. You've created a monster. <laughs> it's good, that's the idea, give them out. NSSED, Suzanne. Uh, the NSSED Leadership Council met on November 9th. Um, it's, the bulk of that meeting was actually spent with something that Dr. Schneider called Leadership Council Professional Development. So in preparation for doing some strategic planning and vision work at NSSED, he is laying some groundwork um, with the Leadership Council. Um, he had shared with us in our board packet an article entitled Segregated Programs Versus Integrated Comprehensive Service Delivery for All Learners, um, which I sent to all of the board members, and I'm happy to share with anyone who's interested. He also presented to the Leadership Council about the history of education and specifically how special ed has factored into that history. He spoke about what's been learned in the past 40 years or so and what current research is converging on as best practices, not only for special education students, but for all students. He highlighted the fact that our schools have become places filled with countless special programs to support a variety of student needs, most of which result in lots of pullout time. He also addressed the outcomes that result from these segregated learning environments being tracking by race, economics, language, or ability, fragmentation of a student's day, too much time spent determining who receives services and who will not, labeling of students and families, fracturing of the curriculum for these students, and it actually being the most expensive way to deliver services. Uh, more will be shared at upcoming meetings as we prepare for strategic planning, and he mentioned that he had given a similar presentation to some of our District 67 administrators and staff. Um, and, and I will say that one of his big messages in all of this was it is not about looking at what you are doing with the best of intentions and 
stopping and saying, okay, we're doing everything wrong. It's about looking at what can we do better to move towards what research is telling us is the best way to meet all kids' needs. Um, we also heard from Heather Meal, who is an assistant superintendent at NSSED. She had been, she had attended an Apple um, conference uh, with two of their technology experts that was mostly paid for by Apple. I believe all they had to pay for were their flights out there. Um, and they had learned a lot about technology and, and what's coming down the pike and, and where our students will be, similar to some things that have been talked about here tonight. Um, we also got a report from Andy Piper, who is their HR leader, and they are, NSSED is about to go into contract negotiations, um, and in preparing for that, um, he shared some of the things that he learned at this conference. It was recommended by the Leadership Council that he seek input from all the member districts, not only for um, salary schedules, but also for how is it that we have gone about negotiating our contracts and, and what kinds of things have we done with them. Um, the early childhood program a new classroom was approved at the meeting. The early childhood program um, that NSSED offers is about is very close to being to capacity this year, and they have enough referrals to fill it by December. So they got approval for a new classroom to open. It won't open until they have students that need to go into it, but they wanted to be ready to open it if need be. Um, one of the questions that came up was, who does this program serve? Are they students from member districts or non-member districts? And all of the students served in this program are from member districts, and they do not anticipate any non-member students being in these programs. Um, the one other thing that I wanted to share with this group is at that transition space, that I was at last time and reported on at our last meeting, one of the requests from NSSED was that if anyone has connections in our community of potential employers for people who are coming out of those programs, if you could get those names to me, they are not looking for a guaranteed of a spot for employment. What they are looking for is a foot in the door at any local employers where they can say, we heard from this person that you might be willing to think about taking one of our students. And they do a lot of work in placing their students. It's not just they drop them off. There's a lot of coaching. There's a lot of talking about what it would involve. And, and there's a lot of NSSD staff being involved in that. So if anyone happens to have any connections that you know of, of employers in the area who might be willing to have a conversation with a career placement person from NSSD, just let me know and I will pass that on to Kurt's staff. The next Leadership Council meeting will be December 14th at 7 o'clock. Thank you, Suzanne. Any questions regarding NSSED? Seeing none, we move to legislative liaison, Beth Clemenson. Uh, there is no legislative report this month. Um, things have been pretty quiet on the EdRed um, uh, front. Evidently, there were some big political changes last week. Um, so <laughs> we will uh, see how that all shakes out in the coming weeks. Thanks, Beth. Spirit of 67 Foundation, Suzanne Sands. The Spirit of 67 Foundation Board met on Tuesday, November 8th. At that meeting, um, our first order of business was to create a new funding mechanism for funding grants. In honor of our founding president, Dorothy Chandler, a fund has been created as a means to address time-sensitive and important opportunities that arise outside of the annual grant cycle. Anyone may apply for a grant from this fund, but the request must be under $1,500 and must be time-sensitive. All other grant requests should be submitted through the regular process. Each request must be reviewed and supported by a building principal and will then be evaluated by the grant committee to ensure alignment with the Spirit of 67 Foundation mission, and the application is now available on the website. We also spoke about the 30-year anniversary gift for the Haskins Center, and more will be coming about that. That is something that will be um, voted on by the Spirit of 67 Board in February. Um, a donations update, the Spirit has received over $93,000 in donations, and 39% of families in the district are currently on the 2016-17 donor list. 
And then for grants in action, um, this fall across the district, students have benefited from numerous grants that have provided a wide variety of educational experiences. Improving the science experience at DPM includes the new garden space as well as a variety of other hands-on resources that, in, that are enhancing science instruction there. You heard extensively about the Electrify Your Strings program. Visiting author Candace Fleming was in our elementary buildings last week reading her books and inspiring students to write their own pieces. All of our fourth graders participated in a program called Barrel of Monkeys, which was a writing experience focused on group writing for the purpose of performing. And the Barrel of Monkeys staff will be back in December to perform the works that students sent in after working on them further in their classrooms. Students stuttering Mandarin at Cherokee have been learning the ins and outs of Weechi. Um, to enhance their language acquisition skills as well as higher level thinking skills required for the strategy game. Students in grades two through eight were treated to the Great American Challenge presidential game show. Kindergarten through fourth graders have been busy reading the Monarch and Blue Stem books at all of our elementary schools and will be voting on their favorite. In February, fifth graders, or excuse me, in, they'll be voting on their favorite in February. Fifth graders experienced the Egyptian Culture Fair um, in the last few weeks, and sixth graders went to Medieval Times for their Culture Fair experience. There's more to come, and there are additional resources being used each and every day that have been provided by the Spirit this year and in past years. In fact, my first grader came home saying that they had used the Star Lab at her school, which was a grant from like the first maybe five years of the Spirit's existence, um, and it's still in use today in our schools. Um, February 10th is going to be the faculty review, and May 4th is the opening doors for education home tour. The next board meeting will be February 14th um, in this room at 9 a.m. Thanks, Suzanne. APT, Jeff. Thank you, Mike. The District 67 APT Executive Board uh, held its last meeting on Wednesday, November 9th here in the boardroom. Uh, the highlights from that meeting include, as Mr. Simic Already mentioned, uh, he informed the board that he's now on Twitter and immediately got six followers, which is wonderful. Maybe not. Um, uh, he also uh, sought some feedback and input from the board with regards to inclusion of social emotional growth measurements on a proposed personal learning profile, and that was an active conversation, so it was actually a good opportunity to get some input on that from parents. In terms of what's going on in the buildings, um, the DPM APT Book Club will be sponsoring a discussion about the book How to Raise an Adult on Wednesday, November 30th at 1 p.m. at the Cube at DPM East. Both Tom Cardamone and Renee DeVore will also be participating in this discussion and all are welcome. If anyone is interested in participating, you can purchase the book at a 10% discount at the Lake Forest Bookstore. Just mention the DPM APT Book Club. At Cherokee, they held their annual Spook Fest on Friday, November 28th and had 20, 260 out of 307 students in attendance for an 85% participation rate, so that's fantastic. And what's even more impressive with that is that Friday was actually a day of non-attendance. So they took a little bit of a risk in having a spook fest on a day of non-attendance, but it turned out just fine. Tomorrow night, Wednesday, November 16th, there will be a Mandarin information night from 6.30 to 7.15 at Cherokee, and each family is interested in participating in the Mandarin program are divided to attend. As uh, Mr. Simic already discussed, Everett uh, held their annual Veterans Day event on Friday, November 15th. This is an exciting event where students are invited to bring family members or friends who are veterans to the school and be honored in both the classrooms and a school-wide assembly. And you're right, it's a tremendous, tremendous event. It really does a nice job. At Sheridan, uh, they uh, honored local veterans on uh, Friday, November 11th and heard from Colonel J.E. Gross retired about the origin and purpose of Veterans Day. They also acknowledge family members of, Sheder of Sheridan students who are veterans as well as current parent parents that are active service members or veterans. In terms of community service, um, the Thanksgiving food drive, I got an email this morning saying that the collection for food for the Thanksgiving food drive has been extended to the 17th, I believe, correct? So if you have not donated yet, or even if you have and would like to donate some more items, there are collection bins in all of the lobbies of the uh, school buildings. Uh, that being said, today was also the first day of food sortation. It also continues tomorrow and Thursday. If anybody is interested in participating in that, you need to let the folks at the Gorton Center know or at Lake Forest, I'm sorry, Lake County Cares know. Um, and that takes place between 3 and 5 o'clock uh, tomorrow night and Thursday night. Uh, then the food will be loaded on trucks for delivery on November 20th, again from 3 to 5 p.m., and anybody interested could just show up at the Gorton Center. Uh, year to date, uh, the APT has sold over $16,500 of spirit wear, uh, predominantly through Kittles. 
Uh, directories were sent out to families in October, so if you did not receive your directory, uh, have your child check their locker. It is bright orange, so you won't be able to miss it. Um, or they can contact Beth, Beth Laufenberg, who is also in charge of uh, the directories. As I mentioned last month, the program called Barrel of Monkeys uh, for fourth grade students was initiated this path, past month where the folks from Barrel of Monkeys came in and worked with students to start building um, stories that they will then take away and come back and present in uh, play form uh, in December. Uh, the student, uh, the emotional wellness and parent awareness committees have been combined into a single committee called Student Parent Awareness. Um, they will now be in charge of the uh, District 67 ePulse newsletter, which went out, uh, had its first edition go out in October. It did include a survey asking parents for input regarding suggestions or topics for a proposed speaker series. So if you did receive the email, by all means, uh, provide some feedback to them as to topics you might be interested in hearing speakers. If you did not receive the email, um, you can always visit your school's website. There is a link. And as Suzanne mentioned, uh, the author Candace Fleming was in the elementary buildings this past week presenting to all kindergarten through fourth grade uh, students and brainstorming with them about how to collect story seeds and discussing the writing process in general. The exec board will meet again, or I'm sorry, will not be meeting in December and will be meeting again on Wednesday, January 11th here at the West Campus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. We now move to public participation again. Are there any members of the public who would like to address the board? Seeing none, I will use this time to share with you something I just was handed. Given this board an administrative for school board members sheet and one of my fellow members handed it to me and informed me that it says, sharpen up your board meetings. Long meetings are the bane of school boards. They crush enthusiasm, drain energy and create boredom. With that, we move on to our action items. <laughs> First up is approval of the tentative levy. Is there a motion to approve the tentative levy? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion realizing that this could crush enthusiasm? <laughs> Jen, would you like to mention anything without crushing our enthusiasm? I'm afraid to. Fair enough. Anyone else have any comments or discussion? Uh, one thing we should say is this came before finance and operations and there are, what we're approving tonight we have several opportunities actually to revise along the way so and the view of the finance and ops committee is um, people can talk if they want to talk we actually have a community member in the audience tonight um, uh, but i think given the votes we're going to take later tonight i think the view is uh, we're doing the right thing by um, making sure um, that we're asking for the appropriate amount excellent any other questions or discussion on this I, I will add, Mike, actually, just so to make it clear, what, what we are talking about is the annual tax levy, and it is limited by the consumer price index, um, which for this particular tax levy year is 0.7, so seven tenths of a percent, which for existing uh, property tax owners, not including bought in interest, is about 219,000. Thank you. Anything else? Roll call vote, please, Eileen. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Novit? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mrs. Sands? Aye. Dr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Our second action item is the approval of accelerating the vision summary for the 2017 summer projects. Uh, if there's a motion in a second, then I'll explain what this is. Is there a motion to approve this? So, so moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, comments or discussion? I'll start uh, for the purpose of letting the public know what we're talking about here. The board uh, and the administration has been working over the past really number of months on what we've loosely called the grand plan or accelerating towards the District 67 vision. The administration put forth a recommendation to the board um, with a variety of things, which I'm gonna read momentarily. Uh, the first three are on the education side involving staff, uh, and then there's a handful of projects as well as a planning. So I'm just gonna run through them and, and say literally a word or two about them. The first three involve hiring additional special ed teachers, life skills teachers, and instructional coaches. Um, three special ed teachers, one life skills teacher, two instructional coaches this year, uh, and a few more in the future years. In terms of capital projects that we're talking about being completed next summer, there's a Haskins Center refurbishment. Um, I'm gonna say the 
capital numbers that are currently associated with these projects. These numbers may actually go down, um, but we're given the, what we're gonna be voting on is giving the administration marching orders to take these, each of these projects to the next level. And there'll be future votes on each of them along the way. Haskin Center refurbishment uh, for 1.9 million. Furniture slash classroom transformation for 500,000. A number of vestibules, start with the DPM East vestibule, nurses station and office for 870,000. Redoing the elementary vestibules, this would be for Sheridan, Cherokee and Everett. Putting in a three buzzer system where all traffic would actually flow through the office. Uh, the estimated price tag on that right now is 750,000. DPM West vestibule, 650,000. The playground at Sheridan and Cherokee, a combined 400,000 and a future spaces plan with uh, $50,000 uh, targeted for that. The future spaces plan, we currently have a number of different plans. We have a vision statement that has an environment milestone. Um, we have a life safety plan that was completed last year. We have a capital projects list that is more about maintenance uh, and sort of ongoing things like roofs and parking lots. Um, future spaces plan would be tying all of those together, as well as bringing industry experts in uh, to see if we're missing anything, to really give us one cohesive and unified plan. That's a list of the projects. Um, the timing again, the projected completion date for these would be September 1 of 2017. Um, while we're saying that date, we're not, uh, the admin is not asking us to tie their feet to the fire on those dates, nor are we tying their feet to the fire um, as we move forward, if there are obstacles that come up uh, that those dates may be delayed, we're going to do this correctly. Um, financing, if you add up those numbers, they come up to about $5 million. The administration recommends uh, that that $5 million is a combination of using the fund balance, using cash from operating revenue, and using debt. The timing of the future spaces plan, which could present additional opportunities for things we would do, is targeted for uh, late, late winter, early spring, March, April timeframe, somewhere in that area. Uh, and if things came up out of that plan, we still would very much have the opportunity um, to issue new debt if we needed to while rates are very low. So this plan gives the administration uh, marching orders to move forward to take the next step on all of these but gives both the administration and the board a whole lot of flexibility um, really with each and every one of these projects. That's an attempt to do a overview of what we're voting on. Uh, if there's anybody who wants to add anything or questions or discussion, uh, have at it. Um, I just want to clarify that um, obviously this is a list of uh, projects that we are going to vote on tonight, uh, whether or not we think they make sense for the vision for the district and things like that. Tonight's vote is not a permanent vote, so we can tap the brakes if a project gets out of hand or comes in at different levels. But as of now, you know, we've talked a lot about this and, and that's what we're voting on, sort of first step. Any other questions, comments, discussion? Roll call vote, please, Eileen. Mrs. Sands? Aye. Dr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Novot? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Next is the approval of the updated Perkins and Will proposal for Deer Path West, Deer Path West nurses space and vestibules, elementary schools, nurses spaces and vestibules, and Deer Path East nurses space and vestibules. May I have a motion to approve that item? So moved. Second? Second. Second. Thank you. Any questions or discussion on this? Seeing none, could we have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Novot? Aye. Dr. Lemke? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mrs. Sands? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Folger? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Action item number four is the approval of administrative recommendation for the development of furniture classroom transformation plan for summer 2017. May I have a motion to approve this item? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Questions or discussion? 
Roll call vote, please. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Novot? Aye. Mrs. Sands? Aye. Dr. Lemke? Aye. Thank you. Item number five was the approval of a policy, but I've been informed that uh, I'm actually asking for an approval to table the policy on the waiver of kindergarten tuition for students at risk first reading. Is that correct that I'm? That's is correct. Is there a motion to table this? So moved. Is there a second? Discussion, comments, questions? Just reiterating that in this morning's meeting, when we reviewed the proposal, we found some opportunities for tightening it up a bit, as well as making sure it went through legal since it will be a new policy. So we decided to table it until after we've had a chance to review it in January. Excellent, thank you. And I just want to add that it's, it's a policy that we're crafting. It's different than when we get a policy given to us through press. This one we're crafting from scratch, which is why we want the extra scrutiny before we bring it for our first reading. Sounds good. Any other questions or comments? Roll call vote, please. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Mrs. Sands? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Dr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Novot? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Number six. Approval of Board Operating Procedures Committee Charter. May I have a motion to approve that item? So moved. And second. Thank you. Comments or discussion? Uh, I, will be, I would be remiss, uh, based on the flattering comments that my committee members provided earlier, to thank them as well for their participation and for staying awake during these meetings. Um, that being said, I don't want to go, I don't want to continue to crush your enthusiasm even further by reading this charter verbatim. Um, it was a bit of a late addition to the packet, but has everyone had a chance to review it and, and do I need to go into any further detail? I think it's pretty straightforward. Long meetings are the bane yeah. of school boards. They crush enthusiasm. The only thing I would like to uh, point out is that it is our intention to have a, a finished product by April of next year in time for onboarding of potential new board members. So uh, we'll be working diligently towards that goal with the idea that we may want to have a workshop at some point. Um, so we don't get too far down the path and have the board say, this isn't what we thought, so we don't waste a ton of time. So maybe in January, early February, we might have some get together to at least show you what the product looks like three quarters of the way through. That sounds like a good idea. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Folker? Aye. Mr. Novot? Aye. Dr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mrs. Sands? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Next up is the approval of human resources items, hiring, leave of absence, request, resignation. Is there a motion to approve this? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Comments or discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Dr. Lemke? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Novot? Aye. Mrs. Sands? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. We now move to the consent agenda. Any item may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of a board member. I'll now read the consent agenda. Approval of disbursements, payrolls, and financial statements, October 2016. Minutes of a regular meeting and workshop, October 25th, 2016. And disposal of audio recordings, February 23rd and March 24th, 2015. Would any board member like to remove any item from the consent agenda? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Comment or discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mrs. Sands? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Dr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Novot? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. We now move to FOIA requests. We've had a few this month, uh, one for Mr. Dan Lichtenstein of Boris Union, and another from the Better Government Association. We also have a pending FOIA from Elizabeth Gordon, who is a non-resident. Announcements, November 23rd through 25th, 2016 is Thanksgiving break, no school. Tuesday, December 13th, 2016 is, the board of, is our next Board of Education meeting at seven o'clock here in the West Campus boardroom. We move to adjournment. May I have a motion to adjourn the Lake Forest School District 67 board meeting? moved. May I have a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 